Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. This one's going to be exciting. We're going to talk with you about uh, something that is vital for human life, food. Uh, What you eat, where it comes from, uh, where you think it comes from, and we're going to talk with our good friend Jeff from Colorado Craft Beef. His wife, Cara, co-owner, is not with us today, but you know all the ins and outs. I know enough to share. Uh, You know, she's the brains behind the operation, but... Uh, I'm the one that likes to drink and talk. So That's good. Well, we're going to do that. <laughs> Jeff, you guys have probably seen in some of our videos for S12, and I know you've seen his wife if you've watched our video from the visit we did to the ranch. Uh, super cool. And I think one of the big things that we can discuss today that, that uh, myself as a consumer and eater of food, uh, a lover of meat, as most of you probably are too, is like, where does it come from? And what are some best practices and things you should know? There's a lot of stuff in the food chain I don't Mm -hmm. think people have any idea or concept of. Well, and I think some of that's by design. Uh, There's some labels that are intentionally misleading to Mm. encourage a buying response. I mean, we we were all in marketing, of course, so we understand how that works. And uh, when you're trying to sell my orange against your orange against the other guy's orange you know how do we make his look worse rather than mine look better Mm -hmm. and some of those labels are misleading and some of them are just flat out false Um, some of them are regulated some of them aren't and some of them mean something in one uh, area of food and something entirely different in another area of food Mm -hmm. so it's very complicated depending on which vertical of agriculture you're working within so on the labeling side if if, if we talk beef if you find a package that says natural beef. Natural, the word natural. The word natural. Which sounds nice to a consumer. It does. Um, but the word natural on a beef package is different than the word natural with cows. So natural cows are non-hormone, never treated with antibiotics, all the things everybody thinks about. Um, I mean, we've talked about it. And mm-hmm. Other people talk about it ad nauseum, basically. So while the animal's still walking. Yes. Natural means it's not being fed certain things or administered certain medicines. But mm-hmm. once it's packaged meat. Natural means minimally processed, no artificial ingredients. It means nothing to how the animal was raised. Okay. And Just you can, what's in the package. Correct. And, it, and that's done because the lobbyists for, those, for the big packers are able to keep that word natural in the beef sector mm-hmm. differently labeled because... It means so much in the cattle sector. Mm -hmm. So the big takeaway is cattle is an entirely different market from beef. They're two different commodities. Sure, sure. And most people think, well, if it's on the cow, it must, of course, then correlate to the rest of the business. And that's just not the case. Sure. And that's that's probably the most egregious one. It's kind of like when I go to the farm market here and somebody's got produce that I can see that's got stickers on it that came from... Mexico or Paraguay, like it's not, yeah, you're at the farm market, but the stuff you're selling, you bought from a produce supplier in the mm-hmm. city and you drove out here to sell at the market. Like, Yeah, and I mean, the one thing I would point out is all the food we've got access to in this country is safe. Sure. You know, it's all nutritious. There's differing levels of care and whatever, but you know, the statement that is probably the most important to understand is we as Americans have the largest, most efficient i.e. lower cost, most regulated food system in the world, no questions asked. And we as Americans are lucky to spend only 9% of our disposable income on food. Mm -hmm. And in other areas of the world, it can be higher than 40 or 50. Yeah, the interesting thing when you think about just like what we need as people to sustain life as an organism, food's like, you can't, I can live without a house, I can live without shoes, I can live without a phone or glasses or even a, even heat. I can wrap myself up and have mm-hmm. like life, but you can only go a little bit without food. Yeah, I think there's a there's a saying that says, uh, once in your life, you're gonna really need a doctor, a lawyer, and an undertaker, but three times a day, you need a farmer. That's true. And there's a lot of people that just miss that. Yeah. And it could be food production, but it could also be, you know, forestry is a part of USDA. Forestry is part of agriculture. Fisheries are part of agriculture. Cotton, of course, comes from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if you really ask somebody, what's your connection to agriculture? A lot of them will give 
an answer that is like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm just really glad there's food available. It's something positive, mm -hmm. but they don't feel connected to it. And that's one of the things we've done at Colorado Craft Beef is try to engage with the consuming public that so, want to engage. So take the customer and re-engage them with where the things that are, they're eating, mm -hmm. where it came from, how it came about. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, probably the most important part of our marketing piece is we don't demonize anybody else in ag. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people in agriculture that do the niche marketing or things like that, that they're like, they don't say mine is better. They say buy mine because everybody else is bad. Mm -hmm. And that's, and you probably see that in the training industry, right? Sure. I mean, it's, to me, it's a poor marketing strategy. It shows a lack of value in what you produce if you have to down talk other people. Right. So, you know, we, I, I recommend buying beef. It's the most nutritious, most bioavailable protein you can buy in this country. Uh, it's all healthy. It none of it has antibiotics in it. If it's on a grocery store shelf, um, what do you mean by that? So people talk about. Uh, you mean the actual thing I'm consuming doesn't have antibiotics in it? Correct. So how can you say that? Because every antibiotic has a withdrawal period. Okay. So if a calf gets sick or a pig gets sick or whatever, you know, we as agricultural stewards. I feel we owe it to the animal to help them be healthy. Okay. So therapeutic antibiotics is a whole other deal. But if an animal shows signs of distress. What's therapeutic antibiotics where they're just administered frequently? If it's in the feed or something else, okay. there's okay. some stuff like that. Um, on that note, the one thing to understand is it is illegal to feed antibiotics for performance benefit of an animal. It can only be fed in this country to, pre to treat or prevent a disease. So that's the one thing. There's a lot of people that think antibiotics are fed to just make them force. grow faster, make them this, make them that. Yeah. That's not the case. It is illegal to feed antibiotics like that and has been since 2015. Okay. Um, so it's relatively new. It is. Um, and it was done through pressure of the industry. Um, most people didn't do that anyway. Um, you know, by and large, most people in agriculture, whether you're farming or ranching, they love what they tend, you know, whether it's a field or it's an animal that's a living organism, even if it is a field, mm -hmm. you know, you driving in, there's fields everywhere. Well, if they mismanage that field, do you suppose they could grow the same amount of stuff on it? Sure. Probably not. Sure. Uh, if we mismanage an animal, the economics aren't going to be beneficial and our ranch becomes unsustainable economically. Makes sense. So, and it costs money to feed them these drugs. And if sure. there'd be no good reason to do it, you wouldn't, mm -hmm. I would assume you wouldn't do it. You're just right. spending money. Well, well, do you fertilize your yard even though it looks green? Like, same concept. I don't. Right. I think that's a big waste of money and it's right. bad, bad for the waterways around here. But yeah. yeah. So if, if an animal is treated for whatever they may have contracted in the pasture. Most common with us is when cattle are on grass, they're out on pasture, like you've seen them at the ranch, mm -hmm. their eyes can get irritated. And it's called pink eye. It's different type of pink eye than we're it's used to. It's not conjunctivitis like humans right. have. It's basically just an irritation of the eyelid and it can get uh, just uncomfortable for them. Their eye starts watering and they could go blind. Well, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the first layer of protection to that is a really low grade antibiotic, like an LA 200, like a penicillin base, or um, you can go like biomyosin, but any one of those, every label of those antibiotics has a withdrawal period. This, um, whatever drug it may be, will say this has a 14 day, 28 day withdrawal so that it's completely metabolized in the system and it's gone. So if somebody says we only sell antibiotic free meat, well, so does everybody else. That's now, pretty interesting. I didn't know that that worked that way. I mean, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure some stickler, uh, either like hippy dippy kind of person or like somebody with like a biochemistry background may argue and say, "Oh, there's some residual stuff in mm -hmm. tissues and potentially." Sure. Um, but if you're eating USDA inspected meat, which if you're buying anything retail, it's all been USDA inspected. Uh, those are inspected prior to slaughter and hanging on the rail to determine if they're good enough for food consumption. Okay. So if there is an injection site or something that the inspector can see, they can condemn the carcass and they do regularly if there's something odd. Interesting. Um, but then you get a really nasty red letter from the FDA and they will shut you down. Okay. So it's exceptionally regulated. 
I think those, it's funny, you know, like in the industry that, that I'm in, the business I'm in, I, I hate the term industry for the training world. I can't believe I just said that. But like just people that love freedom in the Second Amendment, they oftentimes hate things like the building department to tell them how to build their shed or uh, government telling you how to raise an animal and sell it. For example, should a kid be able to raise a bunch of chickens and sell the eggs at the end of their driveway? Like we all would probably say, yeah, but then there are people that get sick because the eggs weren't cared for correctly. So mm -hmm. when you see videos, somebody just sent me one of a, a guy dropping some building materials onto a deck. I think it was some shingles and the whole yeah. deck collapsed <laughs> off the house. While and he like, was standing on it. <laughs> right. Oh, I commented was... like, uh, building departments matter, you know, like there's a reason. And like the FDA, it's pretty awesome that we don't all have E. coli and all these various foodborne illnesses and die like people do in other parts of right. the world. Well, because you've traveled around. I mean, yeah. You've probably seen some meat markets in other countries and you're like... I mean, I've been curled up on a couch in a third world country, pooping and puking, wishing for death. Right. Yeah, because I ate the wrong thing. Yeah, so food, you know, food safety mm -hmm. is something we support. And I think most people can probably say, by and large, I support food safety too, because we don't want people getting sick. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want pregnant women getting listeria and losing a baby or, sure. I mean, and that stuff is real. Um, it's in honey, it's in lunch meat, it's whatever, you know, we just had our second little girl and it's what can or can't you eat while pregnant, even with as good of a food system as we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other countries, that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. There's some interesting, like, like I've got family members that say, oh, well, we don't have as strong a guts as people did before us. And, okay, maybe there's some truth to that. You and I talked about mm -hmm. a guy I saw that lives off of a completely raw meat diet. Like, that guy's got some organisms in his gut that we don't. But also, I don't know anybody losing babies from things like listeria. So, mm -hmm. like, maybe we don't have the same gut biome that we used to where we could eat certain organisms and not die but i also what i i don't i just when i was just in uh, uh pennsylvania i was reading about one of the founders of the declaration and i just one of the tidbits was he had 10 kids five made it to adulthood mm -hmm. this is a shit that was killing right. those kids and we don't have that yeah That's and cool yeah it's, and it's interesting because uh, i think the reason people are able to be so combative in nature over you know food or whatever they may have on their plate to tackle today it's because they no have pun. yeah because they have a full belly yeah they're properly nourished they're not hungry that's because a good point how many problems does a hungry person have they got one they're f hungry yeah that's just it right 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 um you know they aren't worried if it's organic or non-gmo or any of the other buzzwords they're like is that food? Can I eat it? Will right. this pain in my stomach go away? Right. Yeah. Even somebody that's snobbish about fast food or something mm -hmm. like that. If you're hungry enough, yeah, yeah, I'll be I'll be in a trash can before I just die. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you know, as a country, uh, we've still got ten and a half percent of the U.S. population. Ten and a half percent of all households are food insecure. Wow. That's a pretty crazy number. It is. And for all of us to think that, oh, well, this guy needs to change that or this guy needs to change that. I'm like, put that effort into feeding other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of your one of your carry trainer shirts, don't be a dickhead. It's, it kind of applies in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Like you're and I'm not saying ag is perfect, by the way. I mean, there are things that everybody can always do something a little better. Um, but the thing to note is every industry in ag whether it's forestry or rice or cotton or oranges or pecans or peanuts or whatever. If you look at them compared to 40, 50, 60 years ago, there is huge changes in resource use hmm. to the positive. You know, we're using 40% less water. We're using 30% less this. Greenhouse gas emissions are 20% of what they used to be. Like the dairy industry, for instance. You mm -hmm. know, we're not too far from Wisconsin. Um, the dairy industry produces 2.4 times more product today per animal than they did in 1960, and they do a 4% less product. Wow. That, that efficiency is incredible. Sure. Um, and Does there also have anything to do with the 
animals being grown faster, bigger? Genetics is a big part of it. Okay. So um, in the dairy world, you know, you select for certain things, just like in the beef world, just like in hogs. Um, in the dairy world, they select for pounds of milk production. And um, for that reason, there's other areas that they have to work harder in because they have to do what's economically best for the farm. And they're working through all that. And that's all actually uh, being done. I've got a friend in Gainesville, Florida that works in the DNA space. Okay. They can actually pull data from this bull and that cow and do a cross of that DNA in a computer and get 10 generations of data. Wow. Depending on the heritability of the trait, sometimes it's only as far as three. But uh, they're doing that in chickens or doing that in hogs or doing it in plants. Um, so they can see, is this a good cross? Will it be functional? And that's all coming online right now. Mm -hmm. So that stuff's all being attacked from every angle to try to make things more efficient, more sustainable, uh, to keep food costs down, sure, but to also keep food plentiful. Um, you know, for instance, in, and this is one of the weird things in the beef world, the beef world kind of lags behind in some of that technology, especially like the DNA technology, because chickens, they'll turn a chicken house seven times a year. They'll turn a hog barn three times a year. Meaning it's a completely new animals. Yeah, the, the reproductive cycle of those animals. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not a chicken expert. I just know the number is seven times they can get the reproductive data that year for that animal. Wow. Uh, in the hogs, you know, hogs have a gestation period of three months, three weeks, and three days. So that's three times a year, roughly. Uh, cattle is once a year. So just the amount of data you don't get because mm -hmm. the cycle is so much longer mm -hmm. takes the cattle market, whether it's dairy or beef, longer to make those adjustments. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's all, and it's all done in the background. You know what's interesting to me? <laughs> how separated we are. Um, you go to the grocery store or the market and you buy the stuff clean and packaged and neat and shrink wrapped and freezer wrapped and With perfect. proper labels. And, yeah, yeah, labels and you know exactly what it is for the most part. You can dig through a pile. I like the marbling or I don't like, I want the boneless instead of the skin on. I want the, or the, the instead of bone in, I want skinless versus boneless for the- And you can make all those choices. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you just throw it in the cart, go home, and then we've got these amazing freezers at our homes and businesses that we can keep the stuff on hand. And it's not, I mean, even from a hunting perspective where you got to go find it, that's one thing. But people used to have a couple of animals roaming around. Like where I'm at here, we were one of the biggest dairy producing counties in the state here mm -hmm. in, in McHenry County. And there's no dairy farms here. Maybe there's like two or three little oh, tiny and ones. And where'd they move to? Just up to Wisconsin, gone. But like the, the little tiny farms disappeared and the bigger farms like Dean is a huge hmm. uh, uh, uh producer out here all these farms that had 50 or 100 cows or there's these farms with 5,000 mm -hmm. cattle and they all the machinery and all the cool things that go with it that the small farmer couldn't afford but people had those things or they could go down the road to a farmer and now you go to like these areas of the country like by you where there's tons of beef growers mm -hmm. and there's nobody around here. Maybe there's a, a guy that's got 10 head over here, a guy over there's got mm -hmm. something, but there's not, it's not uh, so diversified where people know the people that are producing their food too. Yeah, or if you had a major episode in civilization and you had to feed everybody. Yeah. What time of year is it? Yeah. You know, if it's January in McHenry County, how much food's produced here? Right. How many people need it? Right, right. I would guess the math would be a little troublesome. Sure. Uh, That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything's being trucked in from elsewhere. Yeah. And, well, and if you look at any one of the value chains in agriculture, like the cattle feeding triangle is Denver to Omaha to Amarillo, Texas. And that's like 85% of all the beef cattle produced in the U.S. are fed in that triangle because that's where the feed is, that's where the most of the big kill pack or kill houses are, packing houses, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, harvest facilities, if we wanna to be totally pol politically mm -hmm. correct, they're mainly all right there. So if you're a cow-calf operator and you produce calves that then are grown to be beef, 
You're in Florida. The biggest, this actually the biggest cow calf operation in the country is in Hawaii. Believe it or not, I, I have read about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Parker Ranch. Okay, I want to go hang with those guys. <laughs> so, so that type of a pro, uh, of a production is uh, they're purchasing the calf, mm -hmm. so they're not doing the breeding and birthing and all of that business and raising baby cows that are still nursing. They're buying them like at a certain age, feeding them, and then harvesting them is that what you're saying uh kind of but what i was getting to was the natural flow of commodities okay. for that industry is calves are further out from the triangle and as they get closer to the end state of their life which becomes you know beef in a box they move towards the triangle okay so montana is an area that's very very common for mother cow operations that produce baby calves that are then moved towards the triangle so is florida when you say move those calves are put on a cattle truck or a train car Trucks, and moved yeah. across the country mm -hmm. to that region because the food's there? Because the feed's there. Okay. So you can move more animals on a truck when they're smaller and you aren't trucking the feed to another region. I got you. And then, and since uh, I'd be curious to look at the history of chicken and the egg, but also all the harvest facilities are in that same area. So mm -hmm. when you're moving, um, fed beef, you know, fat cattle that are going to go in for harvest, they're 1,400 pounds. Where when you bring in a weaned calf, they're 450 pounds. I got you. I misunderstood what you yeah. were saying. Okay. So, but to your point of, you know, how does the industry and beef stack up? It is cow-calf operators, which are people that own mother cows. They give birth to baby calves and they sell them usually at weaning. Okay. So they wean them, take them off the mother, and then they usually come to people like uh, my father-in-law. He's a stalker grower, is what it's called, which stalker growers run cattle on grass, uh, put them in a little grow yard and keep them, you know, grass finished to make their, excuse me, grass fed to keep their tummies happy and let them get bigger. And then they go on grass. And then when they get to a certain size, they come off the grass pasture, they go to a feed yard, they get finished for a short amount of time, and then they go to harvest. Let's talk about that just so the listeners understand. So, uh, Cows are ruminants. I know a little bit about this because I raised dairy goats, not the same animal, but they've got the four chambered stomach like a goat does. Mm -hmm. So they are meant to eat grasses, right? They are. I mean, they're, it's interesting. So if you look at a TMR, a totally mixed ration, which is what's fed in a feed yard, it has to have a certain amount of uh, plant material and fibrous material in it to get enough scratch factor, so what they call it, that basically scratches the side of the ruminant wall mm -hmm. and makes the stomach do its job. Mm -hmm. If it's too concentrated, it actually causes issues. It'll cause acidosis, it can make them sick. Okay. So yes, but they also love candy, right? Uh, like we were talking earlier about sunflowers. And by know. candy, you meant sweet foods like sunflower yeah. or corn? Yeah, sunflowers, corn, um, nutrient dense foods yeah and well and one of the grass finished ingredients we use at craft beef is uh malted barley rootlets hmm. so that's a byproduct of the malted barley process that you know of course malted barley goes to distilleries and breweries but it's a byproduct off of that and it's grown barley well let's back up when they make malted barley they, okay. so, they soak it in water which is called steeping they run it into a, either a big bed or a vat of some sort. They spread it out and they start to hit it with heat and it starts to grow. It starts to sprout. So at that point, it's no longer a grain. It's a sprouted product. Okay. Then they kiln it, which is what makes dark beer or light beer. They just cook Delicious. it to stop the growing process. And then that sprout has to go somewhere because you don't want that. You don't want to filter that out in a brewery. So they then run that dried grain across the screener and it breaks off those pieces and those pieces fall out. I see. And we use that. So it's like 27% protein. It's a grass finished sprout, basically. It smells like malto meal. Hmm. Um, I've but, definitely smelled that before. Yeah, man. but they love it. Um, and it's just a byproduct that otherwise would be thrown away. Mm -hmm. And ruminants, you know, are capable of taking things that you and I can't eat, putting it through their ruminant digestive system, and they just keep bashing it up. And, <laughs> yeah, and making, you know, a non-edible product into steak, yeah. which is pretty awesome. That is totally cool when you think about it that way. And that's, I've got this kind of universe 
stardust vision of life like and you just said it they're converting grass to steaks mm -hmm. and their stomachs allow them to do that well and you've seen the ranch yeah we have our our soil type at the ranch is below sand so really Sugar i'm eating sand. grass yes <laughs> you're really grass, grass fed grass. as well yeah. by, by proxy <laughs> yeah. um so all the ground at the ranch is what we would call sugar sand. It's sand that's like the same consistency as if you held a hand fan full of sugar. If you tried to farm that, it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. We're basically on sand dunes. So all the grass that's out there, it's all native grasses. We didn't plant it. It's been there since the buffalo roamed it whenever. We can't farm it. So the best use for that ground is grazing ground. So we're taking non-arable non land that you really can't farm on and using it to produce more food. Mm -hmm. And you know, a square mile or a square mile of pasture where we live is, you know, 80 head per square mile. And you're gonna produce about 25,000 pounds of beef on that in a growing season per year. Interesting. It's, what? Go ahead. You're yeah, that's, that's just the way the math works out. Where if you have an acre of really good corn ground here where we're at, they produce about 7 million pounds an acre. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Or excuse me, 7 million pounds a square mile. That's what I thought you yeah. meant. But yeah, I appreciate you clearing that for clarifying. So, yeah. I was, you were going to get some hate mail on my no, bad but, math. Yeah. Because an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is Kraft Beef? So the company is Colorado Kraft Beef. What does Kraft mm -hmm. Beef mean? So Kraft Beef came from a conversation that my wife and I had with her father-in-law. Uh, he's going to be 65 next week, this week. Happy I don't birthday. know what day it is. And uh, we talked to him when we moved back to Colorado and, you know, talked about the ranch long term. And he basically said, yeah, you know, I'd really like for you guys to, you know, think about how you're going to or take it over. Well, great. And I'm kind of a business nerd. And I asked him, I was like, well, uh, you know, can we recreate or repeat your business model? And he said, no. And he's ran it since 1976. I mean, it's damn near 50 years. That's a pretty big, uh, pretty big red mark up there. If you no, know, you can't because the market's changing. You guys need to figure out a different way. And it's not that he's unprofitable. It's not that he's doing anything wrong. But as you know, consumers change and consumer behaviors change. Mm -hmm. um, he operates in the stalker sector, so he's really not in a captive spot in the market that he has to exist. So if ranches get bigger or packers get bigger and they get more space, they could, you know, in essence, just say, we don't need that guy to do his thing anymore, um, which is where he came from with that no answer. And Kara and I- um, So only because he's got relationships and things like that can he continue, but mm -hmm. he's saying, if you try this, it probably ain't gonna work for you. He, he thinks there is a sunset on that model. Got it. Um, I hope that's not the case, because that's gonna upend a lot of people. Sure. But I appreciate that insight, you know? Now you're walking towards the cliff, kid, good luck. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so Kara and I talked about it for a while, and uh, hey, what do we wanna do? Uh, luckily, we both come from a heavy sales background, uh, she's got a master's degree in cattle nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, well, could we find a way to help people understand ag a little differently? Could we find a way to engage with them? And what better way to engage with people than over a great steak? I mean, we at S12, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people that just know me as beef. They, I don't know that they know my freaking <laughs> <Beef>. name anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the steak guy that yeah. smells like smoke and bourbon. Right, I like right, that guy. Right, right. Um, so it's it came down to you know what can we do and uh we tipped up the company in 2017 with the hope of bringing high quality style steaks direct to people's homes with a connection to where your food comes from so we ship beef nationally once a week mm -hmm. um, the only place we've not shipped to yet is alaska um because alaska freight's crazy and because a lot of people in Alaska know it's crazy, I don't think they even reach out. I had one guy asked me to ship, and of course he's not in Anchorage, he's not in Juneau, 
he's on Kodiak Island. Oh, and I'm like, shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, not only are you in the hardest state, but you're in one of the hardest areas of the hardest state. Send him some jerky. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Just send it to him for free because I've got his address. But, uh, um, but the reason it's that you guys, not under, if you're not understanding this stuff, ship frozen and it gets to you still frozen. Right. It, well, as long as FedEx does their job, that's yeah. a whole other deal. Um, but, you know, in theory, we are growing cattle as perfectly as we can to make the best steak that we can um, with the intent that, you know, from the day those cattle become part of our operation, their whole job is to go in a box. And everything is curated to that. And then, you know, feed is selected and feed is mixed and they are handled you know, as perfectly as we could hope to. What to, does that mean? Well, um, from a meat science standpoint, you know, lack of stress, um, like you've hunted before, right? If you shoot an animal improperly, they can taste a little gamey. Mm -hmm. they, they may, maybe their meat's the wrong color because they got stressed out. So, you know, how we treat them throughout the time that we've got them before they go in a box is you know low stress cattle handling that's why you see horses at the ranch because if you try to move those same calves with a four-wheeler you're going to probably fix more fence and they're going to get more stressed out uh they're uh, if they do need treated we treat them we remove them from the program i'm not going to let an animal suffer for profit it's just not acceptable and what you're saying to the viewer listener is you're not killing them. You're maybe you take them to another ranch where they use means that you don't. They just go commercial. Okay. They go so, into the commercial chain. And that that's not a bad thing. It just means they're not getting the same like excellent existence mm -hmm. out out there pampered on the range. Yeah. Well, and of course, I, I think even some of the people at S12, you know, some of the people that have ordered just through our connection with you mm -hmm. have all said, man, this steak is awesome. Yeah. Um, I just met a gentleman for lunch a little while ago and he's like, my wife bought beef from the store the other day and then was like, why did you start buying beef from the guy in Colorado? Cause now we can't buy beef anywhere else. I'm like, it's that's, true. That's a good thing. It's I'm true. okay with that. <laughs> I, had a, I told you this last night, I had a $70 steak. Some people bought us dinner on our last trip to New Jersey and it was a, a beautiful looking steak from this farm to table place and it was yeah it was just eh. that's everybody now asks us like hey uh, where do you where do you go for a good steak i'm like my I garage. stay home yeah <laughs> and uh they're like really i'm like yeah uh because i don't have to worry about driving home if i have an extra whiskey and pants aren't required yeah. whatever yeah yeah what's yeah. the worst that could happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like it yeah so when you guys got this name craft beef uh, I'd been out to the to the ranch. You kind of described it to me like this animal. It's got no fear of predators because you take care of that. I mean, there's still predators, but you're there looking over them. They're mm -hmm. getting nice grasslands and sunshine and fresh water. And they live like it, if it was in nature, they would be getting chased all over the prairie and mm -hmm. eventually dying in a ditch when their legs busted or some infection and all that, like it, it kind of explain the difference between the way an animal would live without human intervention. And mm -hmm. cause it's, I think sometimes we, we see like a Disney movie and like they're all happy on the planes and right. everybody's, you know, looking at it from that perspective. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is go to Instagram and look up nature is metal. It's a great, I yeah, mean, that's a great one. I, I, I don't want to make light of all the work we do, but Mother Nature is a bitch. Yeah. She does not mess around. I mean, if you're cold or if you're whatever, and, uh, you know, Joe Rogan has said that he likes to eat elk because it's like eating a super athlete because they made it that far in life. And that yeah. is a thousand percent correct. Yeah. Um, but I think the last time I looked up the numbers on elk, there's like a million of them in the U.S., don't hold me to that. I Googled it not long ago, and I think that was the number. Okay. Well, we harvest 680,000 cows a week. So we can't all eat elk. Right. We can't. Yeah. We almost decimated the whitetail population only 100 years ago. Right. There's plenty now, but you can't just all tomorrow start deer hunting either. Mm -hmm. Well, there's. I think that when I Googled that thing for deer, there's 25 million yeah, there's deer. There's millions of deer. But we can't yeah. just start eating them all right. like we did 
a hundred years ago? Well, we harvest uh, 35 million cows annually in the U.S. Okay. We harvest 156 million pigs, and we harvest nine billion chickens. Wow. Billion. Billion with a B. Uh, the chicken market is d almost double the size of the beef market on poundage. It's crazy. Yeah. Can you think of the math of just how do you get that many chickens a day through a facility? It's, I'm out. I'm like, I did the math on the cows because I at least understand that value chain. And it's still like, uh, there's a big processing plant near us. Uh, they harvest 6,000 head a day mm. at full capacity. That's like a semi truck every three and a half minutes. Wow. Just to unload them. I mean, just to physically unload the cattle, that's how fast it has to go. We do need to do a better job of eating less, just in general. Agreed. Like the fact that you can pull over anywhere in America and get a chicken sandwich or a, a burger and I'm not hungry, I'm not gonna finish it. And you toss half of it in the garbage and yeah. you think about this living creature lived, died, and got processed into this food, and you're just so cheap and so readily available that you, you like flip it about it. Yeah, because isn't it like 30% of the food in the U.S. is wasted? It's yeah. Some, it's staggering. It's a horrible number. It's staggering. It's, uh, and that's like a lifestyle thing, kind of, you know, I'm sitting here all pious as there's one, two, three lights, four lights around us, and, uh, you know, this space that's climate controlled to make it perfect, and cameras rolling, so we're just like absorbing all this energy so we can have a chit chat. Right. But, yeah, first world problem. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But I think we, the one thing I like, one, your meat's not cheap. It's value, but I think I've told you this, a butcher shop in my town, I should have sent you in there today when the town I grew up in, they got a sign over the, the butcher counter. It says, good meat's not cheap, cheap meat's not good. And it's I mean, when I was a kid, I'd go in there and buy a sandwich or something. It's been there for 60, 70 years. And you appreciate something, or you should, when you spend a little bit more for it and mm -hmm. understand, like, this isn't just some frozen hamburger patty from Sam's Club that's got a bunch of crap mixed into it, and if I don't want it, I can pitch it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is an expensive, expensive in the sense of how it came to me. This thing's life existed yeah. for me to exist. And so to your point or your question of how would these animals exist without us? Yeah. You know, they would wander to find water. And for instance, where we live, there's no running water for miles so we have solar powered wells on all these pastures so that grassland wouldn't be grazed. So if we're talking about how they would survive, they would stay near rivers like deer do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they would become prey animals just like they should be because that's why they- Cougars, wolves, all that, yeah. Yeah, um, but if we're talking about you know total environmental impact, uh, I've got a cool picture I'll send you. Uh, maybe you could share it about the benefits of grazing some of these grasslands. Uh, we had a fire start on the highway that runs right through the ranch this summer. Luckily it only burned, gosh, it couldn't have been 20% of an acre because it started off the highway, it burned to the fence line where cattle were grazing and stopped. Not because it was overgrazed, but because all the fluffy stuff that would have been tall enough to burn was gone. There's still, still the roots grass there. there. Well, and there's still grass standing, but all the really fluffy tinder, if mm -hmm. you will, has been managed. Not depleted, but managed. So where nobody had mowed between the highway and the fence, burned right up to the fence line and stopped. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if we didn't have ranches where we live and that same fire started, when's it gonna stop? Sure. You know, if it's unmanaged, things like that. That's one of the issues they're having on the West Coast, uh, where I'm from in Oregon, is they graze the far, or the forestry, forestry land. They all have forestry leases. And there's some areas of the country that you can't do that and they have horrible wildfires because all the underbrush isn't tamed. So when it starts, there's no way to stop it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the sayings back in my hometown is a uh, log it, graze it, or watch it burn. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's. That's and, true though. And that's the hard part. Everybody says, oh, the cows are gonna hurt this, the cows are gonna hurt that. I'm like, well, but there's a trade-off. I mean, they're not gonna hurt anything. Um, if you've got navigable waterways, those are all fenced off to prevent erosion events or contamination. But we've gotta kinda let all these systems work together. I mean, there's no, there's no one solution that doesn't have a trade-off to something else. Sure. 
And so, and one of those trade offs is if you don't like any of this, we need to start killing people because people have to eat. I'm joking, but I'm not. It's, it's a math yeah. problem. Yeah, I mean, people have to have food. So, Protect the Harvest, uh, sponsored by Lucas Oil, they do a lot for outreach in the ag world. Okay. I was at a dinner for the Idaho Cattlemen's a few years ago, and they had a gentleman there from Protect the Harvest. And he made a comment. Uh, I, I've not checked the math. I'm just assuming that if you're the executive director of Protect the Harvest, you know what's going on. Sure. And he said that we as a society, a worldwide society, need to produce as much food in the next 40 years as we have in the previous 800. Wow. Based on sheer math. Just the amount of people that are eating. Yeah. And then if you take the beef chain, for instance, um, there's the biggest socioeconomic change we have going on in the world today is countries are getting more developed and people are moving into the middle class on a scale never seen before in history. Well, what do most people do when they move into the middle class? The first thing they do is change their diet. Yeah. They want to have better food. They may not change their house. They may not change their transportation. They may not change their clothes, but they will try to find better food. And that's one of the biggest things we've seen in the beef industry is imports are going up because people want to eat other things. I had a friend that just moved back from South Korea and he's like, yeah, to get a decent steak in South Korea was 50 or $60 a pound. Wow. Just unbelievable wow. numbers. And we bring a lot of beef up here from like Australia, mm -hmm. South America. So most of the beef imports are lean product because the rest of the world doesn't feed grains to cows. They do some in Australia, some in Brazil, some in Argentina, but most of the rest of the world doesn't have extra ground to grow grain to use as food for cows. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're in Colombia, the arable land that they have needs to be used to feed people. Sure. Um, and if you're in places like the Middle East, they have dairy goats. And when the dairy goat is done producing milk, they become food. Right. Uh, and goats, as you know, can live on just about anything. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, um, they'll figure it out. So what we import into this country mostly is lean cuts from other countries because since we are able to feed grain here, we have an additional amount of trim. So there's mm. extra fat. And then we grind that fat back into lean meat from imported product to make the 8515 or the 8020 burgers that we all like. Mm -hmm. Because we're the only place in the world that has that extra trim. Uh, and there's no market for it really. Like we're one of the only countries in the world that makes ground beef. Really? Yeah. Uh, we've got a friend that works for the U.S. Uh, Meat Export Federation. And she's like, yeah, ground beef isn't a thing elsewhere. You cut it, you make it for stew, you do this. Most people don't grind it. It's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Speaking of that, just changing gears a little bit, I can take one of your steaks, whatever it is, the New York, the ribeye, the filet, of course, but any of the cuts, and eat all of it. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing that I'm not eating. And some people are like, hey, you eat the fat? And historically, no, I wouldn't like eat the fat of any piece of, of meat. And not that I'm anti-fat, but um, the fat's delicious mm -hmm. with those steaks. And it's I, you don't feel like gross after eating it or like, what's, why? How is that? Why is that? So how they're fed is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then also an aging process. So aging of animals. So of course, you've probably got a lot of people that are going to watch this that are hunters. Sure. Well, when we shoot a deer, I grew up hunting. Um, I, I think I got some love actually on the YouTube video for saying I like a 25 out six. Oh yeah. It's a you cool know, gun. Too. Gentle, gentleman's caliber. Yeah. So you don't just shoot that animal and then process it the next day. It's just not a good idea, right? Yeah. You want to hang that animal for a week. So you allow it to dry out a little bit. You allow it, allow that meat to, to rest mm -hmm. so that you can actually cut it up. It's that's baby aging, mm -hmm. um, a deer or an elk or any other lean wild animal. You can't hang for more than a week or two and it'll start to actually mold. You've probably seen that. Sure. You're going to trim it off and yeah. you get that skin on the outside. You get a trim off. Well, the reason it's starting to do that is you have enzymes that are working to break things down mm -hmm. in the beef world, especially in the U S uh, commercial beef that you buy at most grocery stores is in and out of a processing plant in four days. It walks in, it comes out in a box in four days. So they harvest the animal, it goes in the hot box, which is the hot carcass. 
um, brings the temperature down, it goes in a cooler room, they get it down to temperature, they pour, they fabricate it, and bust it out the door. Uh, what we're able to do, since we're smaller scale, we use a local USDA processing facility. Uh, we age for 21 days. And we're able to do that because we do have some grain in the finished ration that builds a fat cap on the animal. And as that, st as that beef ages while it hangs, you, you uh, develop that same kind of skin you would on a deer. But since you have the fat cap, you can trim it off. That's why you're able to age longer because that fat insulates the meat because unlike a deer that doesn't have a lot of back fat, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, you don't have to worry about that rancid uh, skin getting sure. into the actual meat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing is the aging we're able to do. And commercial packers just don't have the time to do that. Or the Fe space. It's, feasible. it's not feasible. Yeah. I think uh, actually on the, on the YouTube video, I mentioned it. It's like, you're going to do 6,000 head a day if you want to hang them all for two weeks. You need you know, acres of storage. Acres of cold storage. Sure. Like it's a real estate And issue. you got to chart <laughs> that that all becomes a cost passed on to the consumer too. Exactly, which is one of the reasons our prices are higher. Um, of course, it's also because we're at a smaller scale. Uh, you know, some of the big processors are doing 6,000 or 10,000 animals a day. The processor we use does like 1,500 a year. So his costs are higher. So. Mm -hmm. You know, a commercial harvest facility can probably harvest and fabricate an entire steer for a couple hundred bucks. We're three or four times that sure. per animal. Sure. Um, and that the nice thing is, since you've got that age, you've got something you can talk about, and there is a defined difference in flavor. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, and that's really what it boils down to: is the feed, the flavor, and how they're handled. Mm -hmm. um, minimal stress. We don't move them around a lot. They I mean, and by move them around, I don't mean we're not that they're not able to move. You know, we've got them on yeah, they're out a in the square open. mile. Yeah, they're out in the open, just cruising around. Mm -hmm. But we don't pick them up and move them to different pastures all the time. Um, and that's not to say that that's a bad plan. Um, like you probably, if anybody does any research in the cow industry, or cattle industry, they're going to hear high intensity rotational grazing this is the new thing everybody talks about. High intensity rotational grazing. Okay. So where we have 90 head on a square mile. They'll put 90 head on a quarter of a square mile and move them every three or four days. So they, they go in, they basically mow that section and you move them to the next one. And that activity of mowing that section so intensively stimulates that grass to grow back. And then by the time they come around, it's ready to go again. Where we live, since we have that sandy soil, our root zone isn't good enough to allow for that. And we don't get rain as often as we would need to to make that work. Um, so we do the best we can with the ground we have, but people 20 miles away have a different plan because of how their ranch is set mm -hmm. up. So when people start talking about sustainability within agriculture, sustainability is this really weird concept that everybody thinks that we're trying to be sustainable now, but the U.S. has been working on sustainability in agriculture since 1935 when they uh, issued the Clean Air Act after the Dust Bowls during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. It's not a new concept. Mm -hmm. But let's all be fair. <laughs> if you have a business or a home, you use the toilet to keep the bathroom sustainable, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You're not, not going to do what you got to do on the floor because you can't do that forever. Right. To think that people in agriculture have a ranch and they, you know, don't utilize it to the best of their ability is just preposterous. Yeah. Uh, Kara's family settled where you met us at the ranch in 1913. And people are like, what are you doing to be sustainable? I'm like, well, they've been here 110 years. I think by sheer definition, <laughs> we could probably agree that that's moderately sustainable. Yeah. And you, and there's a lot of people say, well, do you do this and this and this practice? Because they've done some Google research. So what would some of those practices be? Like the high intensity grazing thing. Okay. That's that's getting a lot of market play right now. There's a lot of people talking about it. It's very common in Florida mm -hmm. where they have... Where well, everything know, grows... Tw yeah, 24 months. Yeah. yeah, 24 months a year. Yeah, grows yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can't take a practice and say, you must do this because... That practice it's may dependent. not work there. And you guys are sustainable because you work with inside the confines of what nature gave you there. You're not, if you exactly. had 20 times the cattle, you'd be done after a season because they'd eat everything and there wouldn't be time for it to regenerate. And mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And 
and you would pound the grass out and it would turn into a dust bowl. That's, I mean, some of the reasons for the dust bowl, yeah, there was a drought, yeah, there was other issues, but a lot of it was bad ag practices. Yeah, I mean, we stripped the prairie of all of its grasses and exactly. killed it all under. Yeah, and they're like, holy shit, the wind blows. I'm like, you've been to my house. Have you ever seen the wind not blow? Yeah, it's, like, it's breezy out there. Yeah, we're on top of the hill too. That makes it even better. <laughs> but that's pretty much what that looked like is back when the Lakota Sioux and the bison were wandering out For sure. There. Yeah, it hasn't changed much. Um, so it's interesting though, that sustainability is this new thing. Cause I've had people ask me, well, how do you know you're sustainable? I'm like, cause we're still here talking. <laughs> like, uh, but you know, another weird data point, and this is one of the, one of the scariest ones for me being the business nerd in 1970, if you put a dollar into agriculture, you could expect to make a dollar 35 back. Okay. It's pretty good. Today it's 14 cents. It's dollar fourteen for every dollar you put in. Wow! As an industry, so our profitability as an industry has been cut by sixty-five percent. Why is that? What is that? It's uh, all the big commercial stuff drives down prices, and people like cheap stuff. Sure. And then a big part of it is the processors, the packers, and and that the people closer the the distribution chains have gotten so big. The person that has the most ability to control the market is the guy closest to the customer. I see. So if you are a, you know, to talk about the cattle industry, for instance, if you're a stalker operator like my father-in-law, he's like, man, I got to, you know, the cattle market is decided by the by the Chicago Board of Trade. And that's the, the metric that everybody mm -hmm. trades on. He doesn't really get to change that. Like he can't say, I need more because of, you know, whatever. I, I had a bad grass year. I had to come off early. They're not as big. And everybody's like, well, that means they're going to be worth less because you're paid by the pound. Mm -hmm. um, and also since 85% of the beef processing capacity in the country is controlled by four, com or four companies, they don't really have to let the market work. Hmm. They control so much of it. Um, they can play, they can play with that. And there's actually some congressional stuff going on right now with people looking into that because right now, from a monopoly standpoint? Uh, price fixing. Okay. From a price fixing issue because the free market is being kind of pushed down because there's no real price discovery. Um, because the big four packers don't have to buy things on cash. They contract everything. It's all how they want to do it. There's no independent market guarantee. Hmm. So they can push on stuff. So for instance, the last time that... Uh, beef prices now notice i said beef not cattle so mm -hmm. boxed beef right the finished product that you can put on the on the grill yeah boxed beef is traded on its own market opposed to cattle so you have a live cattle market and you have boxed beef the last time boxed beef was this high because as you guys as you notice and everybody else is like holy crap what happened to the price of steak the boxed beef prices have been going through the roof since covid mm-hmm uh, the last time boxed beef prices were this big, um, cattle fat cattle prices to the rancher were 30, well, roughly $300 a head more. Okay. So the live cattle numbers, it's actually an interesting economic study. As the beef numbers go up, so let's look at COVID. COVID happens, a bunch of kill plants shut down because... Uh, workers don't want to come in. Some of them had union issues. Some of them got COVID in the plants. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden, the beef prices go through the roof because they're like, holy shit, we might not have enough product. Mm. Well, there's cattle coming behind you. They have a natural end point. Yeah. There's no way to stop that. So what happens is, is this inventory of processing capacity goes down. Cattle are starting to back up. Beef on the other side is super expensive, but these guys control the drawbridge between live cattle and beef. And since you have a oversupply of live cattle because the market got kind of messed up, live cattle prices fell apart and beef prices went through the roof, exacerbating the profit spread and allowing the packers to make a killing. That's really bad. Yeah. And That's... the ranchers have to take what they get. Hmm. Hence why my father-in-law maybe recommended we do something different and why we have craft beef. I like it. Um, we're able to protect our margins. We're able to handle our own customer service and we're able to provide a product that 
I think a lot of people like. Yeah, you're t t totally just separating yourself from that whole system. We're no longer a price taker. And the consumer calling you or going on your website is talking to the people that are out there looking at those animals in their backyard. Yeah, I mean, the phone number on the top of our new website, which new website launched last week. Check it out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, phone number on top of the website is my cell phone. And then that finished product, when it's packaged, is on or in a cooler on your property. It's not like off at some right. place somewhere. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a section of a building that is retail uh, retail certified by the health department. Uh, we have the same certification as a grocery store, even though we're not retail. Mm -hmm. uh, wash down, all the other certification stuff, everything's USDA inspected, but it's at our ranch. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually got temperature monitoring on the system. If something goes haywire, it sends me an email. And then if it goes too far, it calls me. Um, but it's all ran by us. It's cool. Um, and, you know, the other thing we've not done is we've never bought beef to put under our label. Like, you know, buy oh, somebody yeah. else's finished beef. Sure. We raise it all ourselves. You know, we buy weaned calves because we do not have any mother cows. And we run them through the process. So the beef that was harvested yesterday, because we're preparing for Christmas, uh, the beef that was harvested yesterday we have owned since... January. Okay. So in January, we were making bets on how many cattle we needed for Christmas. And we're going to be buying cattle and actually the cattle that will be harvested from February to June next year were bought in that same time in January. Okay. So it's a smaller bunch of that larger group that we bought. So I mean, some of these cattle we've had in the pipeline for 16 months mm -hmm. by the time they make it into a box. I think people need to like re envision how they look at the food that they eat. I'm at the grocery store the other day. I was in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and I went in the store to grab a couple odds and ends, and a lady in front of me was complaining about the price of this big, like, jumbo packet of chicken breasts. Mm -hmm. And I just overheard, but they were on sale for 49 cents a pound. Wow. And I just thought she wanted it cheaper. And I'm like, how can you buy? flesh that's grown packaged cleaned you know ready to for you to just throw in the pan for 49 cents a pound and they were you know monster big thick mm -hmm. chicken breasts and, and I, I thought how spoiled are we that you just and that's it was and it was this big pack you know probably four or five pounds right like, that's all that costs all that that all that protein. Yeah, you can't yeah. eat. Go, go buy a freaking living chicken from wherever, you know, I don't know where people would just go buy a living chicken from, but go buy a living chicken and you're not going to pay 50 cents a pound for this living bird. It's, it's like economically speaking, like how is that even freaking possible? Mm -hmm. And so then we we want cheaper, we want cheaper, but then it, it, it to, I'm not saying we need to eat less meat but be more mindful of what we're eating. And then you make better choices. Like we've got a great farm market here. It's all local people that produce uh, all different kinds of uh, animal products, but then all kinds of, of vegetable and, and fruit products. Like you're supporting local people, you're supporting mm -hmm. um, also people that really care about the ground and, the, and the, the animal like you're talking about. Not that these corporations are evil per se, but... I have the relationships with these people. I can right. go, I buy all the plants that we grow in our garden and I know the guy and his kid that's putting the seeds into cups. It's relationships. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a human connection yeah. that we lose because of a phone, mm -hmm. right? So many people are like, you know, what's, uh, some people think like sitting and talking like this is alien. And it's I'm like, weird, yeah. but why is it alien? Shouldn't you be able to share your thoughts with someone? Shouldn't you be able to have a real meaningful conversation mm -hmm. instead of this transactional bullshit through a device that's in your pocket? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, you know, S12 is a great time for that. Yeah, because just... cell phones don't work there. It's yeah. great. <laughs> it's frustrating as hell when you need to call tech support about your smoker. Yeah. Total sidebar. Yeah. Um, but the f and I had to wait for everybody to leave so that the Wi-Fi would actually oh, connect. So you had enough stuff on that. Yeah, uh, had enough go juice to get yeah. get in touch with the right guy. But you know, doing things with other like-minded people and having human interactions mm -hmm. is something I think society is losing. Uh, but to your point about supporting other people to have a business, 
hey man, you're voting with your dollar. Mm -hmm. Every time you spend a dollar, you're voting with it. Um, and if you like a certain type of agriculture, you like a certain type of movie, you like a certain type of beer. Why are there 27 types of IPA in every grocery store? Sure. Because there's market data that says there's a lot of people that voted for IPAs every time they spent a dollar on it. Be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying you have to buy our beef. I'm not saying you have to buy beef. But if you want to support an industry, you support it by voting with your dollar. Makes sense. And there's a lot of people that don't think about it that way. It's so transactional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, but on the flip side of that, you know, to not be super pessimistic, we've had some great interactions with some of our customers because our biggest struggle with craft beef is FedEx, not delivering things on time, wasting product, um, it really trying to, I wouldn't say they're trying to damage our customer relationships, but they're not trying to help them either. <laughs> um, you know, if somebody gets some gunfire gun oil a day late, it's annoying. Right. But, but it's not wasted. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's still good. Yeah. Um, but we've had some great interactions with people who are like, Hey, no, can I pay for the new box too? I'm like, absolutely not. Like you and I have an agreement that I'm going to get you some beef. And part of my business is that risk with FedEx. I appreciate it. So there's a lot of people who have been just awesome to deal with. Um, but you know, try to, try to be more like that. Try mm -hmm. to be more understanding, more accommodating. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the, fl on the flip side of that, we've had guys call us. Uh, I had a gentleman, his name was Marco, out of California. And he called and he's like, hey, I need to cancel my subscription. I was like, okay, man, like, is everything okay? Like, yeah. And he's like, everything's great, but I found a local guy that's, you know, like 20 minutes from here and I'd like to support him because he's local. I'm like, awesome, man, good job. I don't take that personally. Yeah. I'm glad you And you'll fill up that beef is being sold to somebody already. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, no problem, man, that's cool. He's like, well, you're not upset? I'm like, no. Like support other people. I want, I want everybody else growing beef to have an opportunity to be successful. Yeah. How many? How many did you say every year? Uh, we're going to be near 150 this year. I meant like uh, nationally or globally. 35 million. Yeah. So that's just in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 35 million, and you're raising. Uh, like craft beef this year will be maybe 150. Yeah. So you're you you know other people need to exist. P -p like a couple. <laughs> like like I'm I would like to sell all the gun oil, all of it. I want all the gun oil. I don't want anybody else to sell gun oil. But I I can't produce enough gun oil for everybody. Right. You can't produce millions of. Right. Nor would right. I want to. I mean, we need. If we could produce it all in our little corner of Colorado, there's a ton of other space that would need to be used for something else. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, the cattle industry is very wide and widespread. But if you look at the corn industry, the corn belt, you know, there's an area that like 80% of the corn is grown. We're in it. There you go. And most of the soybeans are grown in this other area. Yeah. Cattle are here and pigs are here. And it's all based on the economics of those areas. It all has to work together for one of it to be successful. Uh, probably the biggest downfall to agriculture as an industry is typically for one industry to win, another industry needs a freaking bloody nose. You know, if... if You mean like pork versus beef yeah. or... Okay. And, and I'm not saying that maliciously, but if the pork industry has a scare with swine flu, people aren't going to buy pork, they're going to buy beef. And the price of pork falls and the price of beef goes up. Mm -hmm. So that's the... You know, back to, you know, nature is metal. That's the, just the Same way it thing. has to work. The other white meat. Yeah. Um, or why, you know, pork in the U.S. went up was because China had that issue with a swine flu last year, year before last. And they lost like 70% of the national pig population in China. And that's like their number one their, protein, that's their, right? It is. And so it's interesting. And people don't think about that. Like, oh, pork's more expensive. I'm like, yeah, because... This is a big deal. And they're like, oh, but it's still in the grocery store. It doesn't affect me. Well, not yet. I hope it never does. Um, but, you know, look around and be appreciative of the system that allows you to be so secure in your food. Because mm -hmm. um, it's unbelievable what it takes. You know, we can, you can have asparagus every day of the year here in beautiful McHenry County. When it really only pops out of the ground for a few weeks here. Yeah. yeah. I was in Europe one time and it was asparagus season. 
And those some bitches put asparagus in everything. <laughs> hey, would you like your asparagus salad? We're having all of our piss smells. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I would hate to have been the sewer treatment guy in Austria that year, but it was every restaurant you went to, cheese, asparagus. And, cheese and asparagus, and it's like I, I love asparagus. I, I do too, but it was it was something alien to me. I was like, you don't you mean you don't just pick what your menu is going to be? Yeah, they're like, no, this is what's available now. Which I think is great. It's Absolutely. A, it's absurd about some of the th ways that we go about that. Mm -hmm. Like I heard somebody the other day said, it's absurd that we fly tomatoes around the world because they can be grown mm -hmm. indoors in greenhouses year round somewhere. But like the fact that we're flying tomatoes around the globe is just kind of insane right. when you think about it. Or but, don't eat the tomatoes when they're not in season. Eat something different. Unless you want it. Yeah. It's whatever you want, you should be able to have, right? Sure. I mean, well, that's what everybody thinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying, but that's, <laughs> I think that comes down, when people talk about the sustainability thing, that's always what I think about, like, well, sir, what kind of choices are you making? Are you just expecting, that's, that, here's my point, like, everybody has to bear that burden of sustainability, because mm -hmm. I can't make the grower do all the work, and then I just get to do whatever. It's kind of like um, people that complain about pollution and then they've got two suvs well that's not for me to f i mean i want, I want the the, right. the airline should make more efficient planes but i still want to be able to travel all over the country for 98 dollar airfare to visit friends and family and go to the beach but they need to figure out how to do that so i feel better about well that's the, the planet gun, that's the gun debate too right yeah michael bloomberg who hates weapons has armed security. Yeah. I'm like, hold on, man. Wait a second like, here. <laughs> you're playing a weird game of dichotomy chess here, and what you're saying isn't what you're doing. Right. Why is it our deal? Mm -hmm. Or he talks about global warming, and I think the guy's got like four jets and 30 cars or something stupid. It's a perfect example. Yeah. And, you know, we've all got to hold ourselves accountable, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting to watch people think accountability is a bad word. <laughs> That's true. And maybe folks need to look at themselves in the mirror and think about, like, what's my part in this mm -hmm. global ecosystem? Because I, I listened to this interesting discussion the other day for the young generation that we have coming up in America now that people our age and older, like, oh, look at these, these you know, asshole kids. They don't know what they were handed. It's the first generation in a long time where they see the world as this global community because we have the internet that really connects people mm -hmm. and you and i were raised like in america from our founders it's it's about me i understand that this nation's my nation and i'm going to protect it and love it and defend it but it's about me like what i can hew out of this mm -hmm. wilderness and now there's this completely different like worldview from young people i think it's actually a cool thing and kind of exciting it's different than what like we were taught as a worldview but these younger folks see the world in a different way because of the interconnection that we have. Yeah, because, you know, life in, insert X country here, was foreign to us. Yeah. You had to, you had to read a book. Yeah, like when we were kids, starving children in Ethiopia, like that's... Well, I, like, where the hell's Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. now you can Google it. Yeah. But... Uh, and, or, or have a video chat with somebody that's there right now. Yeah. In uh, real time. Have you... Uh, I know some of the older rancher guys around us get pissed because they used to be really good at bullshitting. And they're like, those damn kids now, I can I can espouse a fact. And they fact check me. And they're like, that's not right. And it just drives these older guys crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I used to be really good at that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, there, there is nothing left unknown. Right. It's cool. It is. Um, I don't think it teaches people to be curious, though. I think it That's teaches true. them to be complacent. That's true. So it's a good point. Yeah, your curiosity. You and that's kind of what we've been t kind of talking about. Like, a, you person should be curious about where does this thing that I'm. There's nothing more sacred to me than my body. Meaning, mm -hmm. like, this is all I got, and what I put in it matters. And of course, we eat junk food and things like that in our life. But if something, I mean, we eat a lot of your beef. I know where it comes from versus just some shit at. XYZ super center. You mm -hmm. had no idea who handled it, where it sat on a loading dock. And of course, we know most of us, and that you already stated that we've got a pretty good system for that, but you guys still got no idea. Mm -hmm. Especially when stuff's coming from overseas, like that's a long way for that 
yeah. package of ground whatever to get to you. Well, and people have to decide what matters to them, right? Because there are some people that are like, I don't care what the food is as long as it's cheap because right. i got other things to worry about. Just fuel. Yeah, like, you know, put it in the tank and go. Mm -hmm. um, there's other people that choose to make that one of the things that matters to them. Um, and it's interesting to watch that dichotomy because uh, we've got some people that will call us with the beef company and ask a litany of questions about everything they might have read on the internet. Or, you know, I had an email last week from somebody that says that said, is your beef antibiotic free? And I said, sent back, uh, yes, anything under our label has never been treated with antibiotics. And she instantly ordered, ordered. like that was her litmus test. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to see some of the people, especially at holiday shows, we're gonna be going to some holiday shows in Denver this, this winter, some of the people and what matters to them, you know, what their value judgment is on this product mm. or their value judgment is on that one thing. It's very interesting to watch that change. What are some other people that uh, purchase your products? So, um, I'm sure people ask you about organic. Mm -hmm. Like what are some of those like top questions people ask? Organic is one. Um, and that one's, I don't want to say pretty defensible, but it's, not as important in the cattle system as other systems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes we get the question about do they eat corn and soybeans because people don't want to support the GMO industry. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it, I actually had one guy tell me, he's like, I actually don't mind if they're corn fed and corn finished as long as it wasn't a Monsanto product. Because mm. he Super hyper hated, specific. hated Monsanto, didn't mm -hmm. want to support them anyway. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can't tell you anything. He's like, okay, no problem. And he moved on. It was no big deal. Yeah. I, I appreciated that he had such an opinion, though. I'm like, yeah. man, you, you really got that dialed down. I've got some family members that would agree with him. They'd be like, yeah, brother. Right. And again, hey, we're, we're fortunate enough to be able to have that argument, sure. have that discussion. We got the gluten-free question once, which was made me laugh. I'm like, it's meat. Of course it's gluten-free. <laughs> like, yeah, that's weird. Uh, there's a lot of people, though, that read a buzzword, oh, I must do this, and I'm like... Like you're out there just injecting some, like, wheat germ in. <laughs> yeah, we sprinkle wheat dust on them. So That's looking weird. at the camera, we don't do that. That's weird. Uh, but it's And people are like, well, i got to eat gluten-free. I'm like, but it's meat. Yeah, like, enjoy. Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to pass judgment, but it's like, if you're going to have a line that's that firm, mm -hmm. understand what it is. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it drives me nuts. The, the uh, uh, antibiotic thing is interesting to me because, like somebody that's going to buy an organically raised animal that's never been fed any medicine, I wonder if they understand what happens when the animal gets sick. Mm -hmm. You know, like what happens to that creature. And, I mean, if anybody's ever had a tooth abscess, mm -hmm. you freaking die from it if you don't go to the dentist and get penicillin or mm -hmm. amoxicillin. Like, that's why people only had two kids make it to adulthood because something as simple as and I'm not like big antibiotic. I can't remember the last time I had to take an antibiotic because I've not been sick, but mm -hmm. that or have an, an infection ravage my body and kill me. Oh yeah, give me the freaking antibiotic. Right. Well, and it's- And that's why they're given to the animal. That's the part that's funny. Yeah, and there's some places we've heard of, and not gonna name any names, that have organic programs, antibiotic free, and they'll have you know relatively large death losses of their calf crop. Hmm. because they're like, no, we can't use antibiotics. I'm like, so you're just going to let them die? Yeah, that's pretty brutal. I'm like, that's... So here's this like moral high ground of we're raising this yeah. this to this standard, but then the animal's dying because yeah. you won't give it a 30 cent pill. And it's, and it's floating on a raft of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it drives me crazy. That's hilarious. Check that out. That's crazy. Yeah. And so it's like, don't think that just because there's a thought of organic or not, that one is better than the other, you mm -hmm. know, do your research. Uh, I actually talked to a buddy of mine in uh, Idaho. He runs a chemical warehouse. Okay. So spray chemicals, all the ag chemicals. So all the things everybody's used to hearing about and, and then some, and I think what he told me regarding uh, some of his chemicals was really interesting to me. So a lot of people would assume that organic crops are never sprayed. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. 
they're, they have to be sprayed with a certain type of chemical okay. that has to be organically labeled. But this, this friend of mine that runs this chemical warehouse told me that, you know, they have 60 SKUs of hazardous chemicals of 200 and however many are in there. He said 80% of them are organic chemicals. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, it's some of the most caustic shit we deal with is organic chemicals because they haven't been engineered to be safe for me. They're just raw elements that, yeah. that just do damage. And he's like, and I'm not saying organic's bad, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said. I'm not saying organic's bad, but how organic is portrayed to the public is not accurate. Sure. Um, sure, that makes good sense. It, it's craziness. It's, it's, it's the same level of foolishness when we were kids to have the four food groups mm -hmm. or um, don't eat fat, eat low fat, no, you have margarine. Yeah, don't eat eggs, right? Yeah, or don't yeah. eat eggs or, you know, eat, drink your milk every day. Like it's, it's all, the, we, you told the thing enough and you believe it to be true. And so you decide, uh, I mean, if you want organic, go to a local farmer and buy the produce that they're growing in their big mm -hmm. garden plot. And that's yeah. probably about the best you're going to do. I buy honey from the neighbor. But if you're buying it at a, at a huge grocery store yeah, that came in on a truck, they're growing it at scale. Now, for instance, organic within lettuce makes a ton of sense. Lettuce has a 21-day growing period. Mm -hmm. You can grow that organically. Um, Antibiotic-free chicken, like never treated with antibiotics. You can do that because a broiler that comes in a package, like the lady for 49 cents, those chickens are only seven weeks old when they're harvested. Wow. Pigs are four to six months old when they're harvested, so that's a little higher, you know, level of scrutiny if they can make it that long without needing treated. The average beef cow is like 15 months old. They've made it through two winter cycles. Mm -hmm. Winter's really hard on cattle. They made it through weaning. weaning. Weaning's really hard on them. So when you say, oh, I have to eat never treated uh, antibiotic meat, great. But understand what you're asking. Mm -hmm. What bar are you trying to set? Mm -hmm. Antibiotic-free chicken live in Confinement houses, you know, some of those houses are a couple million birds. They're oh, humongous. Oh, it's crazy. Um, and they have to clip their beaks because they're super vicious to each other. Yeah, They'll they, attack each other. Yeah. So do what you got to do, but be educated. You know, look into what you're trying to figure out instead of reading an article and making an opinion. Um, it's, it's interesting to me to watch things move like that. And then if you think about the sheer math behind organic farming to kind of close the loop on that. On average, if you take all the products that they grow organically, on average, organic crops produce 16% less yield. That's average across crops. But if you do organic corn, which is of course a huge acreage amount of corn, mm -hmm. if you do organic corn, it's about a third. So you have a third of the yield, you know, you'll grow- For the same amount of work. Yeah which is why the price is higher. Mm -hmm. And there's only so many people that can do that until you start to run out of resources. Mm -hmm. um, you still, and then you've got to think about your carbon footprint. Yeah. And um, there's probably people screaming at their phone right now listening to this. But Are you, are you screaming? <laughs> but you have to harvest. You still have to plant. You're going to spray that field. How much diesel are you burning for that same acre to produce a third of the product? Mm-hmm. Um, or for everybody that loves their beautifully manicured green lawn, yard grass uses three times more water than corn does. So let's really think about resource allocation. Yeah, I think yard grass and the, the uh, fertilizing and all that, the maintenance of it is just absurd. Mm -hmm. It is so stupid. I hate it. I do too. It is so <laughs> stupid. But I hate puncture weeds too. I know there's guys listening that that sell lawnmowers, fix lawnmowers, cut grass. I love you, but I think it is, and I think people that spend all their free time manicuring weeds and spraying chemicals all over their lawn to make it look like a golf course is insanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's insane. I, mean, I think it just as a group, we need to be more mindful of the resources we are using. Yeah. Um, Get some goats. Let them trim the grass. <sighs> If you want to have goats, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I don't want any goats. Do what you got I do. mean, everybody, I think, within reason should have a small plot of growing ground. Like, even if you're in an apartment, you can grow some stuff on your patio or in your your uh, uh, 
And you can grow your own spices. That's yeah, that's yeah. really spices common. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have some sprouts. I mean, it's just too easy to not do some of that. Can you, can a family grow all their own produce? Some people can. I mean, you don't need that big of a plot of, of mm -hmm. dirt, but not if, all year you can't. No, yeah. well, depending on where you live, all right? Yeah, and you could have. Hey, instead of going on vacation, you could put put a small greenhouse in with that couple thousand bucks. You know, people mm -hmm. people do that. Yeah, and and people need to. I, I think if I could summarize what you're saying, please do quit being a hundred percent consumptive. Yeah, there you put go. Put something back in. There you go. Even if you're producing your own basil for whatever, mm -hmm. you know, try to try to add back in somewhere. Yeah, um, and it's fun. You can take some to your friends because you usually are going to end up way more than you need. Mm -hmm. For like, I mean, outside right now, my tomato plants, even though it's getting cold, are still producing. I can't eat any more of them. Uh, you know, the fun thing to grow is mint. Oh, yeah, I've got a then, pile of it out there. And then make mojitos. There you go. <laughs> like, <laughs> there you could have a lot of fun like the, with this. This is like the 87th uh, reference to booze from Jeff, so we know what his pastime is. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, I like mojitos, too. Uh, mojitos are pretty outstanding. I actually had to take the shovel to one of the mint patches because it began, like, taking off. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I had to put it into a bucket. Whoops. Yeah, it, stuff goes like crazy. Well, uh, friends, some and the mint thing came up because some friends of ours grew some mint. And they froze it so okay. that we can use it because we have a rack of lamb. And I'm uh, going to do like a mojito rub. There you I'm go. I'm going to make a mojito flavored rub to put on that and then smoke it. I It'll be good. Be pretty legit. That, sh that should be awesome. You could package that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe you should. Hey, covered a lot of ground. What? How do people find you? How do people find Colorado Craft Beef? How do they uh, find you on social media? Mm -hmm. How do they get a hold of you to order or ask questions yeah uh the website is www.coloradocraftbeef.com uh -huh. uh, we are at colorado craft beef on all the social channels uh, we're very active on all those uh, understand we don't have any employees so if you send a message to instagram it lands on our phones uh, mm -hmm. either care or ice phone and uh you know cell phone numbers at the top of the website cool so if if uh somebody orders beef today online uh, how long do they normally, you ship like once a week or something? Yeah, we ship every Monday. Okay. Uh, depending on what you order and all the other weirdness, uh, usually arrives Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So you're, you're going to get it usually within a week or so. Yeah. And it shows up, you've got a couple packages, I remember, but um, it shows up in a some type of freezer rated box. You've got various types and you've got freezer packs and mm -hmm. uh, you still use that. Uh, like the, the plastic one? Yeah, or that, the, oh, the corn fiber. Yeah, the corn fiber. Yeah, so our insulators aren't fiber or aren't uh, styrofoam. They're biodegradable corn fiber. So you can actually just wash them down the sink. It just kind of like dissolves when it gets wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, and people have really glommed onto that because if you're in a high rise in downtown Chicago, throwing away all the styrofoam and all that stuff is just annoying. Yeah. So. Uh, we do that, and then we have a fully reusable, larger shipping container that comes out with a return label, and you just blast it back to us, and we sterilize it and reuse it. Yeah, so it. so the person, all they got to do is drop it for the FedEx man to pick up. It's got the label in the box you've mm -hmm. already printed for them. They they just slap it on the box and put it out for the FedEx guy. Yep, and about one times out of three, the FedEx guy will pick it up. <laughs> so <laughs> those guys drive me crazy. Yeah, uh, busy dudes these days. Yeah, uh, I made a joke on a podcast with a buddy of mine in February that, you know, last summer I had a horse fall down with me and separate my shoulder. I think you laughed at me for that one. I didn't then, laugh at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then like two months later, after I got my shoulder healed up, I was getting ready to go back to jujitsu. And that morning I got hit in the face with a steel gate from some cattle and they hit the gate and bashed me in the face and cut it up pretty good. I remember that. And I made the comment that... uh both of those things were still more enjoyable than dealing with FedEx. <laughs> so. That's funny. Yeah, we're going to do some jujitsu tonight. I got my coach Dan's shirt on. We're going to go to uh, Alpha tonight, and then we're going to go back again in the morning. You train out at the compound in Denver. Yeah. So uh, any, any of you guys from Denver, if you're not training jujitsu, you could go to the compound. Yeah, Morrison Butler's uh, my coach, and that guy's legit. Um, he's... He's got a neck my size, and he's like 5'8". That's awesome. Geometry's tough. <laughs> so. And you've uh, uh, came to town. We're going to do do some screwing around later probably and, and have some fun. 
Uh, and you guys are going to take it easy on me, right? No. No, not at all. Definitely not. We'll do some. <laughs> I brought summer sausage. Can I buy people off to maybe? <laughs> maybe. maybe, but probably not. <laughs> probably not. Hey, you're the summer sausage guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> people that have listened, watched, uh, enjoyed, what would you tell them, leave them with if they never met Jeff Smith? You know, I've got a couple things that I really am trying to teach my girls. That if, if they get to be an adult, I want them to know these two things. Stay away from excuses. Hmm. And never go up to someone wondering what they can do for you. I dig always, that. Always try to add, you know. Asking people, do this for me, do this for me. You don't want to be that person, you know. And the, mis and the excuse thing isn't don't make excuses because we all do it. Sure. But it's more so if you see the excuse, you've identified the issue, fix it. Mm -hmm. Don't let it be an excuse. That's on you. The second you notice the excuse, it's on you if you allow it to continue. Makes good sense to me. And add, don't be a, don't be a vampire. Yeah. I like that a lot. Hey, if you guys that listened, if you enjoyed this, the discussion, if it stirred you a little bit, I mean, think about next time you order a steak or, or che a cheeseburger, that was a, a living organism that you are allowing your organism to continue uh, breathing another day because it gave its life for yours, usually against its will too. But that's the nature of things, right? I, I say slow down and appreciate it, smell it, savor it. And you know, you notice like the cheap ass products that are out there they don't smell as good as the they like the odor from like the cheap go out of the commercial yeah, meats. Yeah, it's a little and, sterile, right? Yeah, that's not, how I feel about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's the lack of aging. The okay. aging, the flavor or the the nose you're getting on that is the aging. It's interesting. Yeah. Pay attention to the food, enjoy it. You know, I, I heard something really cool I'll end with this recently talking about all the business, the th things that we do to build our life and like have stuff, it really just comes down to like wanting experiences, mm -hmm. like the one we're having here. Like I want experiences. I want to watch my kid laugh by the pool. I want to enjoy a, a nice steak or a nice drink or go to the movies. It's like, just enjoy the experiences. That's yeah, because that's all it is. I need you to sign the, the board for me. Happy to do it. Sir. Yeah, please do. You guys... Share this if you dug it. Get a hold of them. Buy some meat. We've got a discount code. It's Carry Trainer. I think it's good for seven and a half percent off, mm -hmm. isn't it? Jeff's always like, "Did you have to tell them about the discount?" Yeah, I did. So use <laughs> Carry Trainer for a discount code. Buy some meat. Message me if you do it and take a video of it. Show me how you're cooking steaks. See if you can teach me something. I wonder if you can. Yeah. And uh, holidays, man. We do a ton at the holidays. If you need to do some gifts. That's a great gift. Uh, the, and a ton of businesses actually utilize us. Drew would like if you sent him some beef. Tell Drew thank you for all of the editing work and videography work by sending him some beef. Drew's like... <laughs> <laughs> Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com. Said I got me some
Yeah!